Congressman Tom McClintock is back with us on Washington Journal, Republican from California, senior member of the Judiciary and Budget Committee. I want to get to some of those congressional issues, Congressman, but let me just start with that news from just about a half an hour ago. Uh, WNBA star Brittany Griner released from Russian custody in that high-profile prisoner swap that's now already happened between the U.S. and Moscow. Just your quick reaction. Well, my first reaction is that's great. My second reaction is who is this arms dealer, and was that in the interest of the United States? And I don't know the answer to that question. And we may get some more answers from President Biden. He's expected to speak uh, perhaps in the next 15 minutes or so, and we may be getting a little bit of that. But, uh, Congressman, uh, let me move back to Capitol Hill. Uh, and I, there's a lot of work to do in the 117th Congress still, but let me jump to the 118th Congress mm -hmm. and uh, your first vote in the 118th Congress on, on January 3rd. Uh, are you going to be voting for Kevin McCarthy for Speaker of the oh, House? Absolutely, yes. Do you think he'll have enough votes to be Speaker of the House? Well, he has a majority given to the uh, uh, to, to the Congress by the American people. Uh, whether that majority acts like a majority is yet to be seen. And um, uh, I, I believe in the end it will. You believe in the end he'll have 218 votes yes. on the floor needed? Uh, he met with Republicans and the conference uh, to talk about rules for how Republicans will run the conference in the 118th uh, Congress. Uh, and uh, it was a place where you made some rules, suggestions for changes. What did you suggest? Well, I, I actually introduced a, uh, a motion to ban earmarks, the practice of members of Congress directing public money to their pet local projects or their favored supporters. Uh, that was a um, uh, practice uh, that created widespread corruption in the Congress in the 1990s and 2000s um, and promotes the process of log rolling, which makes it very difficult to control spending. Uh, we did away with it uh, when we were in the majority. Uh, it was gone for 10 years. It was brought back in the last session, and uh, I was very disappointed that my Republican colleagues uh, 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 did not vote to ban the practice into the future. Why was it brought back? Uh, because it was very convenient for members to uh, direct money to their pet projects and to their favored supporters. Uh, you know, a, a, a local company uh, makes a product that the Pentagon neither wants nor needs. Uh, what do you do? Well, you grace you yourself with the local congressman, get them to write a bill, you tell the Pentagon they're going to buy this product they don't want and don't need, uh, and then you repeat the process. Of, uh, it, that, that, that's the source of the corruption. Uh, and worse than that, it turns the, the federal budget into a grab bag for local pork projects, literally robbing St. Petersburg to pay St. Paul. Traditionally, projects that exclusively benefit local communities are paid for by those local communities. When a local community comes to a congressman and says, we want this earmark, what they're really saying is, this project is so low on our priority list, we don't dare use our own taxpayers' money to fund it. But if you can find other taxpayers to pay for it, we're all in. So when members of Congress who support earmarks come on this program and, and we ask them this question about earmarks, they'll say that earmarks help get things done on Capitol Hill. It puts skin in the game for no, members. It helps them no work question. together more. No question about that. You put a few ear, local earmarks in a bill that a member, by his own judgment, would never think of supporting. Suddenly, this very bad legislation becomes a local imperative he dares not vote against. How is that a good thing? That distorts the judgment of Congress, and also it promotes the kind of law growing. It's not just the expense of the earmarks. It's these massive spending bills that the, uh, that the earmarks uh, then grease. And for the members of Congress who say it helps get things done? Well, in a time when people complain that Congress you know, isn't getting things done? We had them for 10 years and things got done. The difference is things get done through a competitive bidding process, not by a congressman doling out money to his favored supporters and groups. That's the whole point. Worthy projects don't require earmarks. Worthy projects do very well in a competitive evaluation. It is the unworthy projects that need the earmarks. In terms of what's going to get done here in Congress in the next eight days or so before a potential government shutdown, how do you see this playing out? Uh, I can't read minds and I can't tell fortunes. I don't know. I know what I would like to see, and that is uh, a very short CR uh, that gets us into the new Congress when the, uh, the will of the, the people, as expressed in the last election, can be expressed. 
uh, that's going to be critically important given the enormous deficits that we're running. I mean, unprecedented, the, the amount of debt that is crushing the economy, that is driving uh, the worst inflation in 40 years. That's going to require very serious, immediate attention. And Republicans are going to have to be very stubborn and learn to pronounce the word no. The uh, column in today's Wall Street Journal, uh, former uh, chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, Bill Graham, one of the uh, co-authors on that column, uh, the Republican House can restrain spending. The slender majority is the only sentry at the gate. Uh, what is keeping uh, this uh, majority from possibly restraining that spending? What is what is your concern? You mentioned well, I mean, again, earmarks the, the, as one the, of the them. Ear, earmarks is a big concern of mine. Uh, I, I think we have to get very stubborn about grants. Uh, uh, grants are now consuming uh, half a trillion dollars a year of federal money. Uh, to put it in perspective, it's, it's consuming $4,000 of an average family's taxes every year. Now, th these are not uh, you know, contracts for goods and services. We're basically throwing money at, uh, at people, telling them to go out and do good things. Uh, there's uh, a very little follow-up. Uh, 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 very little accountability, very little results, and my experience has been a lot of that money simply goes into the salaries of these different organizations and agencies uh, so that they can say glowing things about the work they're doing uh, and uh, apply for more grants next year. This is now the third largest expenditure in the entire federal budget behind only Social Security and national defense. Uh, we've got to address that. Uh, if the government needs a service or a good that the government itself cannot produce, it should put it out. It should put out a, an RFP, uh, a request for bids, get competitive bids, award it to the lowest uh, uh, responsible bidder. That's the way it needs to be done. This business of just throwing money all over the country uh, is killing us. With that, let me let you chat with callers. It's 202-748-8001 for Republicans. Democrats, 202-748-8000. Independence 202-748-8002. Congressman Tom McClintock with us until the House gavels in, and that's expected at 9 a.m. this morning. Kerry is in New Berlin, Wisconsin. Republican, you're up first. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, first, a quick comment. Um, of course, that's great that Brittany Griner um, has been set free. But I guess I wonder what about there's a there's a man who also has been held prisoner there for a number of years, and I think there's several others too. So I guess my only concern is why just because she's an NBA star does she get priority over others, which is doesn't seem fair. But I get I'm glad she was set free. Um, <clears throat> a question for the representative. I know that, and, and let me start by saying I feel horrible for the millions and millions of people who live in poor countries and want to come here for better economic opportunity. That said, I understand that we are required by, I guess, international law to accept as many people that come here and claim to you know, need asylum, um, even though they can't prove it right away. So my first question is, is every other country in the world also required to take an unlimited number of people seeking asylum? And what is the difference between asylum and refugees? Because I think we do have a limit on the number of refugees. Well, first of all, the premise is wrong. There is no, no international authority that requires the, the United States government to do anything, uh, uh, let alone uh, accept refugees. We, we set uh, caps uh, on, on refugees, and in addition, we, we provide asylum. Uh, but asylum is supposed to be limited to those who, uh, who are uh, fleeing a government that has targeted them for um, uh, oppression because of their membership in specific groups, religious groups, uh, 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 political groups, uh, ethnic groups. Uh, that's what asylum is supposed to be. And once you have crossed your first international boundary, you have now separated yourself from the government that is oppressing you, uh, and you only have a right to claim asylum in that country. What we're seeing today is aided and abetted by this administration is something completely different and unprecedented. Uh, we've essentially collapsed our borders uh, uh, and allowed uh, now, well, we've seen 4.1 million illegal border crossings uh, since the uh, administration took office. While that was going on, we know of at least a million gotaways who evaded capture as the Border Patrol was overwhelmed changing diapers and arranging travel. And we know that 1.4 million of these illegal immigrants have been deliberately allowed into our country. Um, uh, that is uh, having repercussions now in every community in America.